So thanks so much for having me uh, today for DC Flutter. We're going to talk about Flutter Web. And specifically, we're going to kind of go through um, a walkthrough of a use case for Flutter Web, which is the devcommunity.org website, which I hope a lot of you have visited. Um, but we'll kind of talk through the process in building it, why Flutter, um, how it's architected, some lessons learned, what worked well, some challenges that still exist with Flutter Web, how it compares to Flutter Mobile, and um, just go into more detail, and then, of course, take some questions. Um, a little bit about me. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, as Vera mentioned, uh, I spoke at the first uh, DC Flutter meetup, and it was more kind of a Flutter 101, and this was, I guess, maybe over a year. It was definitely last year. And uh, that was uh, around the time I started tinkering with Flutter. Um, so really happy to be back with you all. Um, I'm a team lead at Capital One and focused on um, building out the Capital One mobile app. So I'm, um, I have an iOS and Android team uh, that work to build features like rewards and balance transfer and others uh, that go into the Capital One iOS and Android apps. Um, outside of work, uh, I was previously an adjunct professor at George Washington University. Um, actually taught there for about six years and focused on teaching iOS and Android development. So that was a really awesome and rewarding experience. And I think a big part of what has made it not scary for me to uh, be in front of people anymore. I used to be terrified of doing things like this, but um, it's definitely much easier these days. Uh, outside of kind of work and teaching, um, spending a lot of time with my uh, almost nine month old, uh, Ellie, who's in the photo. And then of course my wife, who's also at Capital One. Um, I love teaching and, and knowledge sharing, whether it's events like this, as I mentioned, like teaching at the university level, um, lunch and learns at work, really just any, any way, you know, if you're gonna spend time learning something, um, you might as well, you know, share that experience with others. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. Um, you still love playing basketball. I mean, basketball is kind of my whole life besides the baby's kind of my life now, but before COVID and the baby, um, uh, basketball is everything and it's hurting me so bad not to be able to play right now, but I've shot around a couple of times uh, by myself, but I'm enjoying watching basketball. So NBA playoffs and the final start, really excited for that. Lots more Netflix these days. And then of course, tinkering with new tech, which would include Flutter and, and Flutter Web. And that photo was taken at Lake Anna, if anyone's interested. All right. Um, so. You know, I, I've been around the Flutter scene um, for a while, and I, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about just like, you know, why. So my my background uh, is heavy in iOS and Android development, building natively, you know, twice for each platform, um, and I've kind of made a career out of it. Um, you know, and we've seen cross-platform evolve over the years from PhoneGap, which was kind of the extreme, maybe worst case, to things now like Flutter, which I think is the extreme positive case. Um, and I, I just very much believe, you know. It can't be the most efficient way to, to build software if we're building everything three times. Um, and there's a lot of risk that comes with, you know, building it three times to three teams with potential for, you know, inconsistent UI and business logic. And I've seen, you know, a lot of that over my career. Um, obvious benefits to showing code. Notice I, I'm not talking about maybe Flutter specifically, but, you know, whether it's something like Kotlin Native or Flutter, you know, we can solve certain things once and things like localization, testing, accessibility, uh, and then use that time hopefully to build more features or devote more time to innovation projects or, you know, building out more like bells and whistles or delightful animations, things in our UI that maybe sometimes we skip over because we just don't have enough time and we want to ship this thing business as usual. But I think, you know, by using cross-platform, we potentially um, could save some time and then allow for our core experiences to be better across all platforms. Um, and of course, platform specific code has its place, um, you know, iOS and Android specific UI paradigms and features. And of course, you know, OS specific things, iOS 14 just dropped with home screen widgets, which, uh, as far as I know, I think still going to require a fair amount of platform specific code to, to get something like that working. Same thing for like Android instant apps. Um, and before we kind of dive into the Flutter web story with Dev Community, I, I did want to just talk about some advice that I've just had over my career. Um, so I found this quote recently, which I really like. So working hard for something we don't care about is called stress. Working hard for something we love is called passion. And this project has definitely been uh, a passion project for me. As I mentioned, I really like to uh, tinker with new tech and um, Flutter Webs and Flutter generally has just been a really awesome experience from a developer perspective. Um, and you know, I posed the question to the audience, you know, do you have a passion project? Um, you know, you can attend these meetups, you can watch videos, you can read articles, tutorials, but, you know, to me, nothing replaces the hands-on experience. 
and I know we're all busy and with COVID, you know, a lot has changed and we might even have less time. Um, but I do encourage you to try to find the time. And, you know, if you truly want to learn that new skill, um, sometimes you'll have time on the job and I certainly do at Capital One. Um, but a lot of times it, it does take some time um, on your own uh, to learn a new skill or kind of advance in a skill that you're already familiar with. Um, so I'd encourage everyone, you know, think about a problem you have or a personal friend or family member has, um, or maybe some kind of manual task and think about how you might automate it or, or build some experience or feature or app or website that kind of helps solve the problem. And I've always found like personal problems um, that affect you or someone close to you, like solving those are always more motivating. I'm always willing to kind of spend that extra time and, and find the time to, to do that. Um, if we time travel back to 2011, that's how I got my start in mobile development. Um, I wanted to learn this thing called iOS and Android and it was super new at the time and my job a long time ago didn't, there was no projects that were it was government contracting and it was a little too early for, for mobile in that space. And uh, I kind of had a side project. I was engaged and uh, spent about a, a year learning iOS, uh, built the first prototype launch five days before our wedding. And it was a really cool app for guests to share photos and get schedules for weddings and see the menu. And, and really, you know, I wasn't really taught mobile. It was really just learned by doing. And, and that's really what I can say is like responsible for my career in mobile development. So, um, you know, very old school looking app, as you can see. Um, but really, that was like my, my jump into to mobile. And, and it was a really powerful thing to uh, to work on that. And I was, of course, super motivated because this was my wedding. And this, this was, you know, there's 200 guests that were going to potentially be downloading this. So um, pretty fun story. Uh, and then the other piece of advice, you know, teaching is the best way to learn. I'm sure a lot of you have heard that. Um, that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Um, uh, you know, it's certainly a forcing factor in achieving your goals. Uh, so if you think about me signing up to, to present at this meetup, um, it really kickstarted me to, to spend a lot more time building out devcommunity.org. I had a basic prototype built, but you know, in the last month between signing up to speak and actually speaking, I've spent so much more time cleaning up the code, uh, polishing up the UI, making, thing, making sure that I understood things better just because I knew I might have questions and, and I knew yeah, when you speak, you wanna speak confidently. And, and getting that hands-on experience typically helps you with that. Um, you know, the project's not perfect yet, the code's not perfect, um, but I, I do owe you the audience. Uh, the reason I spent a lot of that extra time to, to learn was because I knew I'd be speaking. So I, it's kind of crazy, but I, you know, a lot of times I'll sign up to do stuff like this as a forcing factor to, to kind of push me over the edge to learn. Um, this is what it looked like, the first prototype. Um, wasn't very mobile friendly. It wasn't really, attractive at all, and I'm not a designer. Um, but I did work with someone else, uh, a friend of mine and, and uh, at Capital One, and he uh, uh, he gave me a mock-up for like something that could make it look better. So in the time between signing up and, and speaking tonight, um, I kind of made updates to kind of give it a fresh coat of paint, and I think it, it looks much better, and it's uh, actually very like mobile responsive. So what's Dev Community? Um, so it's a family of meetups supporting uh, our community through learning events like this one aimed to inspire and accelerate developer growth. And these topics right now mostly span mobile, web, and cloud, but they don't have to be limited to that. And of course, speakers are very much welcome. So if anyone in the audience is interested in speaking, it's okay if you're a first time speaker, uh, we encourage that. Uh, we wanna see fresh faces and, and new ideas. Uh, and as I mentioned, what a great way to, to learn and improve your communication skills. As far as the website, um, kind of we had this goal to do a few things. One, we wanted to kind of aggregate and display our meetups across our, our family of meetups. Um, we wanted to highlight recordings from our prior meetups. So that's one of the, I think the best things about Dev Community is people like Vera and Larry, thank you so much for helping to organize this. They, uh, they spend the time to get Zoom recordings set up. So even if you're not able to attend this due to whatever reason, uh, uh, on the website, you can actually um, check out our, our recent videos and go to our YouTube channel and, and check those out. So I think it's a really powerful thing. So thank you all. Um, we wanna make it easy for the community to speak. Um, so I'll demo all this on the website. And then uh, we have a newsletter uh, that we wanna drive signups to that just kind of talks about tech news. And yes, I could have used a bootstrap website our template uh, to build this thing, uh, but where's the, the fun in that? Uh, I did spend a few first, my first few years of my career doing more web development and web app development, and I was so much happier shifting over um, to mobile. And I've kind of found through building for web using Flutter that web is no longer this like icky thing uh, to me. I'm, I'm actually like pretty motivated and, and excited to, to, to build for web, especially knowing whatever I do, for the most part, cool also kind of poured over uh, to mobile, which I think is a pretty powerful thing. 
So we talked about the tech stack, Flutter Web, um, uh, Firebase backend, and, and I'm gonna actually pause for a second because I think I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, this is the website. Um, so, you know, not super fancy, but as you can see, um, you know, a couple things, we have the upcoming events for, and you know, we highlight the event if it's the same day. So there in the top right corner, you see the Flutter web talk I'm giving now. Um, we pull in recent videos and of course you can jump uh, to more videos on our YouTube channel. And I encourage everyone to subscribe to that. Um, uh, and we have our family meetups on the left. And at the top, you can see, you know, uh, we have our Twitter uh, feed, YouTube channel, and of course you can volunteer to speak and sign up for the newsletter. So that's kind of the basic feature set right now. Um, and it seems pretty basic, but uh, a lot went into it. And I, I think there's a lot of potential to do some pretty cool things going forward. Um, and one thing I did wanna call out is Android Summit. Uh, this is just a little ad banner on the, the Flutter website. Um, that's next week, October 8th and 9th. Um, this is almost a practice run for me. I'm, I'm giving a similar talk next week, but uh, uh, there's multiple tracks uh, and I encourage everyone to consider uh, attending. Um, it's, it's inexpensive and it's virtual and it's gonna be amazing. So definitely consider uh, signing up for Android Summit. All right, back to the slides. So back to the tech stack, we talked about Flutter Web um, using Firebase for the backend. And you know I've always called Firebase a developer's best friend. Um, just really easy to use and I'm using a Firebase function uh, and Firebase storage to kind of uh, drive uh, the website. As far as data sources, uh, the YouTube channel has a, a XML feed. I'm just using a simple XML feed to get the YouTube channel videos and then uh, meetup.com has calendar feeds for each meetup. So I'm kind of pulling data from there. Uh, and from a CI CD perspective, every time I uh, push a commit, uh, it automatically will um, publish uh, a new version of the site to um, GitHub pages, and then that's attached to devcommunity.org. So thanks for Johnny for getting that domain stuff set up. Uh, GitHub Actions, I didn't have experience with that before this, but that was another cool learning opportunity. Really, really powerful thing. I'm using it for a very simple use case, which is you know, on commit, publish a new uh, version of the site, but uh, there's lots of power to it beyond that. Um, so why Flutter Web? Um, I already had experience on Flutter Mobile. Um, from a Flutter perspective, I wanted to really kind of learn and test out something new and go, go beyond the hello world. I, I'd done a, some, you know, a lot of tinkering with mobile, but never had something kind of to put out to the public. Um, so I looked at this as a way to use Flutter and for it to have more of a purpose, because we actually did, you know, publish this thing and it is public to the world, which I think is neat. Um, I like the flexibility to extend this to mobile. If I wanted to publish this to uh, the App Store or Google Play, I could, I could do that without a full rewrite. And, a, and uh, the last bullet, uh, you know, CSS is my enemy. I'm still, uh, after all these years, still struggling to uh, center things in CSS. And I know there's better ways to do it these days, but I know back in the day, I, uh, I struggled with that very simple thing. And um, I much prefer the mobile platforms for uh, design and layout than, than web. Uh, why Firebase? I talked about that. Another nice thing is the free tier of Firebase is definitely enough for the use case of this website. And I already had a ton of experience, um, a lot of hackathon experience, building prototypes using Firebase. Um, it's just, it's a dream to work with and um, it's great. Love it. If you haven't used it, tons of great tutorials online um, to get started. And this is what the architecture looks like. So we have the clients on the left. Um, and uh, a couple times a day, I have a Firebase function, um, which is kind of like an AWS Lambda, and that uh, I just write in JavaScript. And uh, a couple times a day, it goes out to Meetup, and it goes out to YouTube, um, parses the data, and then basically creates a JSON file that's stored in Firebase storage. And I'm kind of using that JSON file as the API. Um, you might ask, why don't I just go directly to uh, the data sources? Um, because we don't post Meetups all the time, and we're not posting videos on the time, all the time, I, I didn't think it was necessary to be making all those extra calls. So basically, I think it's I, I have like take four snapshots a day, and that's good enough to, to drive the website. So we don't need this real time, instant, you know, feedback when we post a meetup, it, need, it doesn't need to show up on the, the website right away, because typically we're posting a meetup, you know, weeks in advance. I'm also I'm just going to take a second and pull up the zoom chat just in case I want to answer a question here. I'll uh, most likely come back um, to some of these questions, but I'm, I do now have it up so I can glance at it while I'm speaking. 
Um, so I mentioned Firebase Functions. If you haven't used it, this is what the dashboard looks like on the Firebase console. Um, uh, it's really easy uh, to set up. Um, uh, and so basically on your local machine, you can, you can write Firebase Functions and, and JavaScript and, and some other languages and then um, either run them on demand um, or just have them scheduled to run every so many hours, days, minutes, whatever it is. Um, so I chose every six hours. And then those are some logs. So when you're debugging, you know, uh, you know, you can you can check out the logs. So you can make sure it ran. So it ran today at two forty six. Um, and uh, in a function, I uh, rather than use a database. Remember, this was kind of built as a, a prototype, and I've kind of been polishing it more as I go. Uh, so there's some rough edges here, but I kind of hard code the meetups. We're not popping up meetups every day, so I don't necessarily need something more robust than this. Um, uh, and what I do is I have our, this is what a Firebase function looks like. So notice you can kind of use real human text to schedule it. So you just say every six hours, um, you don't have to use like a regex or anything. Um, and then I have a fetch meetup and videos function. Um, and ultimately the result of that gets written to a, a JSON file that's uploaded um, to Firebase. Um, meetup, I just hit the meetup endpoint and uh, I'm just hitting their calendar feed for each meetup that we, um, that we have and it's really easy and you have to deal with api keys i know a more robust version you might officially hit the api um, then also i'm hitting uh, youtube's video videos xml for the youtube channel that we run so that has all our dev community videos uh, this is a little hard to read uh, but ultimately uh, the right side is the json output and that's what the flutter website hits and that's kind of the api um, uh, for the clients and and on the left side you can kind of see i have a public firebase storage file called api.json and that's that's what the website's hitting um, and you know the architecture for CICD so on my laptop I do a git push um, I have a YAML config in my github repo and it's all open source so anyone's you know I welcome you devcommunity.org you go to the, uh, the top bar there is a, a link to the github page or the github repo um, and then upon uh, the push github actions will publish the github pages um, which is just really great and once again no cost for at least the use case that we have and the traffic that we have and uh, dev community sits in front of that and then in the domains attached. Um, I skip over that one and this is what the YAML file looks like and I definitely borrowed this from a probably a medium article template. Um, definitely are lots of great resources on the web for this. So project walkthrough, um, I just want to show you all kind of what things look like under the hood and then we'll deep dive deeper into some of the um, kind of specifics around how things were, uh, were done. Um, this is a little small. Uh, this might be challenging. Um, well, if you, can you see Larry? Yes, what you see? Uh, it's a can little we... small. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll just speak. I, I probably should have taken a screen capture of this lesson learned. Um, but ultimately, I, I have my project broken out to similar to a lot of the mobile apps that you might have worked on. So I have my, my model files that, that map to my kind of my objects that come from my API, which is my just my JSON file. Uh, I have my networking code uh, just in, in a file. And remember, our, I only have really one get request, so it's pretty simple. Um, each screen, and I can, I can make this bigger, um, I only have one screen in my Flutter website, which is the home screen. Of course, for each new screen, I would want to create a new Dart file. Um, and then uh, what you'll see that I did, hold on one second, get to the right spot. Give me one second. So, Ultimately, my home, home screen is driven by this content widget. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about responsive design uh, in a few slides. But ultimately, I decided to focus on three screen sizes, uh, desktop, tablet, and mobile. And I kind of just used screen width as the determinant of what I was dealing with. Um, for the most part, uh, I focused on desktop and mobile. I kind of determined that tablet was kind of a big version of mobile. Is that ideal? Maybe not. But the tablet population hitting the website is probably going to be lower. Um, and ultimately, uh, my mobile version and my desktop version are returning um, widgets, and they're kind of composing all of my sub widgets. So if you think about the website, we have kind of the list of meetups, we have the list of videos, we have the hero image and the description of the website. All of those are components, and if you see here on the left, 
um, I've kind of, you know, when I first did this project, I literally had one Dart file and everything was in it. Obviously, that's not the right way to do it. That was the quick and dirty solution. Um, over the past month, I've been kind of working to kind of split things out and architect it in a much better way so that uh, my, my UI, like my widgets are reusable um, and I can kind of better lay things out. Um, so if you notice here, I have my hero widget, which is like my image and my, my description for the website. Uh, I have my videos widget that gives me the grid of, of YouTube videos. Um, I have my meetup event widget, which is like the card for each meetup event um, that you saw on the website. So this is kind of how the project's um, architected, um, just to give folks an idea. Of course, for much more detail, hop onto my, uh, the GitHub repo and you can kind of check things out. Hey, but Jared, I will go in a little more. Yeah. Oh, just one, one of our guests said that you can try presentation mode in Android Studio. It might be helpful next time. Yeah, no, that's super helpful. Uh, well, I will keep that in mind for next week. Um, I'm not going to jump back and forth a lot, but I will keep that in mind going forward. I appreciate the tip. Um, from a testing perspective, this is something I didn't have time to, to play with in the past when I was playing with Flutter Mobile, um, but I did do a little bit of um, integration test building. Um, so I have a simple integration test that uh, an integration test in Flutter is basically an end-to-end -end test, a UI test. And uh, it basically makes sure that the uh, API comes back and we have a content and the API, not only uh, the request finishes, but then the data from the API is non-null. Um, so that's a pretty good kind of high level test to, to make sure things aren't broken. Um, the way tests work is on the left side, this is my Flutter UI code. And notice that I have a uh, future builder here that's that's basically calling fetch data and getting the data back. If things are uh, come back okay, uh, then I return kind of my content widget and uh, I give a key to it. And that key is basically a string that's attached to that widget and identifies that widget. Um, and then the very simple integration test that I do uh, is I say test API comes back successfully. And then I'm checking to make sure that the home screen content widget key is visible, like has rendered on the page. Um, and I'm passing this thing called a Flutter driver, which is um, important if you want to tap or enter text on the screen. It's kind of a way to orchestrate um, a UI test. Um, if I have some API issue, notice I just return an empty container. Is that ideal? No, of course not. Um, uh, you know, in, the, in a better state, we'd show some kind of error message or, or whatever. But in a simple case, this is kind of my very simple test to make sure that you know, my, my, my API is coming back. Of course, my API can come back with zero meetups and zero videos, and that would be a, another test I'd wanna uh, create. But for now, this was just my introduction uh, into integration testing. Uh, to run this thing, it's, it's a simple command line, Flutter Drive, um, and then it'll kind of run through all of your tests for you. So that's just an example of a Flutter integration test. Localization was something else I wanted to tackle. Um, you know, I think in the past when I was focused on Flutter, I, I was very focused in my free time on just like using it to build UI. And I wasn't super focused on some of the things that are actually quite important if you want to bring this thing to, to production and, and use it on a, a wider scale. Things like um, testing, things like localization. Um, localization works, it's fine. Uh, it's definitely, you know, I always compare localization to Android and, you know, I. It definitely does not beat the strings XML, the simple the simplification like that that Android provides. Um, but once you have it set up, it's it's pretty easy to use. Um, uh, one thing I don't love about it is when you're accessing uh, strings, they're stringly typed, which means you know you have some room for error and typos. And to see what I mean, um, I I pulled my strings out into a, a JSON file. So I have an English file. If I wanted to translate this, I'd pass this English file to a translator and maybe they'd give me back a Spanish file. I'd bring it into the project, make a few minor tweaks, but ultimately I'm not gonna have to make tweaks all over my code to, to make this thing work. Um, so here's some strings in a JSON file. And then if I wanna reference them, I have a helper function where I pass it uh, uh, a key and it'll pass me back um, the appropriate, you know, English or Spanish or whatever language I support. So that's just a very simplistic view of what localization looks like in Flutter. Um, I've seen some third-party plugins that get rid of the stringly typed accessing of translated strings. Uh, I haven't played or, with it or incorporated it yet, but that, that is on my list because I don't like the idea of potentially having a typo 
here and then and then ending up with a, a, a bad string. Responsive design. This is where I spent a lot of my time. And as I mentioned before, you know, when I was playing with this a while ago, I was just focused on Flutter Mobile. Uh, I wasn't even thinking about tablet or, you know, you know, typically a lot of, if you think about a lot of mobile apps, they don't necessarily take into account tablet and then you end up with this really wide mobile view that's not optimized. Um, so I really wanted to make this thing look good across mobile, tablet, and web. Um, and so uh, I ended up using a lot of media query, which is a, a function, a, a kind of a helper within Flutter to determine things like screen size, screen height, screen width. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I decided to focus on desktop and mobile, but I did account for tablet in a few cases where tablet had all this extra space and I wanted to, to do something with it. Um, I leveraged a base widget class um, to make it easy to access device information. So that's things like orientation, screen size, and even like the parent widget size. So you know kind of the, how much space you have. Um, and there are frameworks that help with responsiveness. I was trying to reduce the number of frameworks that I pulled in just to kind of simplify things. Um, so I decided against using a third party dependency, but maybe that's something I'd consider uh, in the future. So this is what things look like across, let's see, iOS on the left, Android next to it. The top right is Flutter Web. That's what we've been focused on most of the talk. And then that's the tablet view on the bottom right. Um, one thing you'll notice that I did um, was on the web, um, there's plenty of space. So I show the events and the recent videos all at the same time because we have all that width. Um, on mobile, uh, because I'm limited in space, I decided to use the segmented control, which is a built-in Flutter widget. And on mobile, you kind of toggle between events and videos. And I found that a, to be a pretty good way to kind of not overwhelm the user and try to do too much. And it also reduces the amount of scrolling um, that you would have to do to get to the, that content. Um, and then what I noticed was on tablet, um, if I would just mimic mobile, what would end up happening is I would have these very wide cards. So I'd have a long, a very wide card, a very wide card, and it just like looked really bad and it was a really poor use of space. So what I did was kind of did a check and, and looked at the available space. And I, if, there, if it met a certain threshold, I actually switched upcoming events to be a grid instead of a, a list. If you wanna check out how I did that, definitely check out the GitHub repo and uh, you can kind of to look at that, but I, I thought that was a pretty good way to kind of take advantage of the extra screen size on tablet. Um, you know, we all love to think about Flutter as this magical, beautiful thing that just works. Um, you know, there are some rough edges and I still do have some question marks around the consistent experience that we tend to be promised with Flutter. Um, uh, I just wanna give a couple examples uh, for the most part, it just worked, um, but I, I have a few unsolved. I haven't spent time solving these yet, but uh, I do plan to spend some time. So you'll notice the segmented control on mobile, like iOS and Android looks pretty clean, um, but on web, um, uh, and you only see it on web if you shrink the uh, website to a very small width. So basically a mobile web client, uh, you'll notice that um, there's like a broken line there. That's super minor, but also it, it kind of, kills a little of the magic. And I would hope, I shouldn't have to say if iOS, Android this, if web that. Um, once again, I haven't looked into it. Maybe it's fixed in an upcoming release. You know, I haven't looked into issues, but small, but you know, you want, you want these little things to be, um, you don't want little things like this. Uh, it kind of, you know, removes some polish. Uh, another thing I noticed is same code. In this case, web rendered my card and, and rounded my edges at the bottom great, you know, perfectly. Uh, on mobile, for some reason, and once again, I haven't had time to, to look at this. Hold on. I haven't had time to look at this, but on mobile, you'll see um, it does not round the corners at the bottom. And once again, this is the same code running. Um, so it's little things like this where I want to latch on to Flutter and go all in, um, but I do see things like this that kind of bug me. And, um, you know, it's not perfect yet. Uh, I think I can forgive Flutter Web for not working correctly here, right? Because Flutter Web is definitely earlier days than mobile. However, it's surprising to me that Flutter Web works on the right, but then mobile has an issue on the left. So once again, I have not tried to, to dig too deep here, but I did want to call this out as just something that I, that I learned in, in my experience. And PRs are welcome if you look at my code and see something uh, silly that I did.
All right, so what went well uh, in, in building for uh, Flutter Web? So I, the rapid development with hot restart. So Flutter Web doesn't yet have hot um, reload. Hot reload is when you make a, a save and then your, you know, your, your, um, your widgets just update on the fly. Uh, hot restart is still um, pretty good. Um, you know, you do a save and then pretty much instantly Flutter Web refreshes the page. So you almost get the hot reload effect, but there is a little bit, a tiny little delay. So it's not quite as magical as, as Flutter on mobile. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I'm not a designer. So uh, just with mo just like with mobile, um, it was pretty, I, I'd say easy to get something looking good out of the box with the out of the box widgets that that were provided, especially the, uh, the card, the card views that I use for the events and the videos. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned, you know, Figuring out responsive design approach took some time, but once I settled on an approach, um, I had a pretty good rhythm for building across screen sizes. Uh, so that, that worked out pretty well. Um, some challenges. Um, so we talked about inconsistencies on mobile versus web. I don't know how widespread this is, but I just those are two examples I, I had given you earlier. Um, there's also some weirdness with, with Flutter Web in that you, know, you expect for a website to be able to highlight text with your mouse cursor. Um, Flutter Web doesn't support that, and there is a little bit of support via a plugin for highlighting text, um, but you can't highlight text across widgets. So normally on a web page, you could highlight like the title of an article and the content, and it would all highlight you copy and paste it somewhere. Um, Flutter Web, even with the plugin that you might want to use, uh, you cannot highlight or uh, across widgets. So it just it feels weird, and it, it feels like it, it doesn't fit in. Will the average user care? Um, Maybe not, um, but it is something to call out. Um, some developer gaps. I mentioned the best approach to responsive design. Um, Flutter's official documentation has some stuff there, but it's not super detailed. And I think it, it could use some additional love. Um, we talked about lack of hot reload. Um, something I didn't bring up with testing is those that, that test that I showed you all on the slide, um, that worked fine for Flutter Mobile. Um, but I had a lot of issues. I still haven't gotten to work on Flutter Web, and it's not clear to me if it's a Flutter. Um, the same exact test worked on mobile and passed successfully, and then on web it, it didn't, even though the code was the same. So that was another inconsistency that I found that I need to spend more time digging into. Uh, and then generally, Flutter, Flutter learnings. Um, I mentioned localization feels a little overly complicated compared to something like Android system. Um, and then on the testing front, um, Generally, you can do the basic things like I want to have uh, integration test that taps something, types in some text, and then taps the submit button. That use case is very well supported. Um, but I wanted to do some things like have it tap the uh, segmented control. You know, the if I go back, so this segmented control, I wanted to write an integration test that would go in here, tap recent videos, and then check to make sure there was at least one video. And I cannot, for the life of me, um, assign a key and get it to work where I wanted it to tap the recent videos part of the segmented control. Um, so I think there's still some some room there for improvement. And if anyone on the call knows how to to solve that and ha and can has the code working correctly, then great. Please definitely message me, and I'm I'm all ears. Um, so what's next? Uh, so I want to uh, come up with a strategy to to dedo meetups. So if you look at the uh, the website, give me one second. Um, you'll notice a bunch of repeat events. Um, our meetup organizers are trying to promote Android Summit. And I think that's really great. Um, but we, def we definitely need some approach to, to we don't want all the, the duplication in this upcoming event list. We want to be cleaner. So I need to come up with some strategy uh, to, to do that. And I don't necessarily have metadata given the, the meetup mechanism I'm using. I'm pulling from the meetup calendar feed for each meetup. So I need to kind of find uh, a solution um, to that. I want to jump more into testing. Uh, I didn't write any unit or widget test, so I definitely want to play with that. Um, dive into accessibility. That's something where I've heard Flutter Web is lacking from like a screen reader support because of the use of Canvas. Um, I would hope it would have improved by now, but um, that's something I want to dive into and learn more about. Uh, I'd like to actually take the step. I, I have English working. I'd like to even if I'm using Google Translate, I'd like to you know, try to get some Spanish in the app just to, to test that out and make sure that it works correctly. Um, 
move more constant or move, move more uh, magic numbers outside of my uh, widget code and move them into constants. I've done some of that, but definitely room for improvement there. Um, I'm using, using good, good up pages, um, but maybe think about using a Firebase storage for hosting the website. Um, I'd like to publish uh, to Google Play in the App Store. There's not a huge reason to do that right now because there's not really mobile specific features, but I do want to spend some time and if the community has some ideas, definitely I'm, let me know. I, I'd like to come up with and build some mobile specific features that, that make it worth um, publishing uh, to the App Store and Google Play. Uh, some shout outs. Uh, thank you, Larry uh, and Vera for um, running point on organizing. Johnny for connecting the dev community org domain to GitHub pages and doing the social media. Jared Sheehan for you know, his leadership and um, massive community, community building efforts on devcommunity.org, Android Summit and beyond. Uh, Ian Hirsch uh, for helping uh, mock up the new uh, UI that you saw live demoed on devcommunity.org. Uh, and of course, the rest of the dev community core team um, for their support and feedback. Um, and just a final reminder, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, you know, definitely find your passion project if you don't have one already. Um, you know, learn by doing, super important. And then, of course, you know, share that knowledge. It could be at a scary meetup event like this where you have a bunch of people attending. It could also just be publishing a blog post, right? So, you know, whether you're an introvert, an extrovert, uh, or terrified of people, or, or, or speaking in front of people, or, or you like it, like, Think about how you might share that knowledge. And, and as I mentioned earlier, it's a really great forcing factor uh, to, to learn. So with that being said, um, thanks so much. Uh, this is my contact information. Um, find me on Twitter and that's my personal website. Um, this photo is actually taken from uh, uh, Google I.O. a couple years ago when we actually had that event in person. Awesome time there. Uh, but I'd love to open it up for uh, questions. And I do see some on the uh, mm -hmm. Zoom chat. But I'm, if you don't mind, I'll just read out the questions, Jared. Want me to do that? Uh, sure. Go ahead and. So yeah. So John M asks an opinionated question. <laughs> <laughs> he says, "Do you think Dart needs Flutter, or could it survive without it?" Yeah. So that's a great question. I, I don't think I have enough uh, knowledge under the hood to fully understand the decision. I know Dart is uh, a Google language uh, and Flutter is a Google framework. So it makes sense. They would partner those two things together. Uh, personally, um, you know, I, I think Dart is still playing catch up to Kotlin and, and Swift. And if I could choose Swift or Kotlin to build Flutter apps, I certainly uh, would do that, especially with a lot of like the, I know Flutter, I know Dart is improving. It's like, um, uh, uh, null checking support and a lot of the, the fancy language features around null safety. Um, but, you know, Kotlin and Swift have had that for a long, long time and I, I enjoyed using it. So moving to, to Dart, especially before some of the null, uh, null safety stuff in Dart, Dart uh, I missed it. So um, I am not a, a Flutter or a, a Dart lover. Um, uh, I just see it as a, a tool to build Flutter applications and kind of the only way. Um, you know, I, I think it's quite similar to kind of JavaScript or TypeScript. So I do, you know, uh, I, I think that's in some ways good and in some ways not, but um, that was a kind of a rambling answer. So I don't, uh, oh, I see. Oh, I actually, I think I read this question wrong. Does Dart need Flutter? Oh, so if Flutter didn't exist, would, it, would enough people use Dart? I, I think probably not, is my personal opinion. Sorry, I misread the question. Yeah, does Dart need Flutter to survive without it? Yeah, I think Dart, uh, <clears throat> so Dart came before Flutter, right? So it was there before. And I don't, I think that's kind of the answer. It doesn't really need Flutter to survive. Um, but it might need it to thrive. Who knows? Right, that, that's what I was just about to, yeah. yeah the yeah. thrive versus survive question. Yep. Survive, yeah. So um, the next question, Dave. Park asks the, uh, you kind of answered this question, but if yeah, you, so the, the like current state of collectible text, text um, I mentioned that there is a plugin that sort of helps, but only for individual widgets. And once again, I think that might only even be for text widgets. Like I don't recall, I, I did play with that plugin and I don't recall it working for like uh, images or other content on the page. So I'd say it's still quite limited. And, you know, is that something that's going to turn off your user? I mean, maybe if you're, Think if you're a news site in Flutter and you're, you know, a lot of times people on news sites might want to copy a snippet from an article. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think it's a deal breaker for devcommunity.org, um, but I think for certain websites that are pretty content heavy, I think um, that it needs to be something they think about. I think the latest I saw was 
a GitHub issue where it was actually, I think it was closed and I'm not, I'm not sure there's a ton of progress being devoted or a ton of effort being devoted to this, but mm -hmm. I don't have the inside scoop inside Google. By the way, real quick, and uh, just to repeat the plug, uh, if you look at the chat box, everyone, there's a discount for DC Flutter members for the Android Summit. It's in the chat box. So Lucy and Chondo asks, do you feel that the APIs that you were talking about, are they limited for to Flutter? Uh, so are limited for Flutter. So I, I may need a little more clarification here, but um, they're standard, uh, uh, the, the, the data sources that I'm hitting via Firebase functions are really kind of just XML or JSON files, and I'm kind of just pulling from them a few times a day. Uh, and then the uh, ultimately the the mobile app or the the Flutter clients are just hitting a JSON file stored on uh, Firebase storage. So I wouldn't say there's any limitation. I, I think I'm a little limited in the API's data that I'm use that I'm obtaining because I'm not hitting like the official meetup API or the official YouTube API, API I kind of took some shortcuts to just um, pull kind of the, the surface, the basic surface stuff that I needed for dev community, which I mentioned was, you know, I needed the title, the date, a thumbnail of the video. Um, I don't need a ton. Um, so they were fine for my use case, but in a more, you know, detailed application that needed much more information and data. Yeah. Like you'd want to use um, the official APIs uh, but I don't think Flutter, there would be a limitation there. I think the only thing to mention is, you know, with some of them, typically from iOS and Android, you, you get these really nice um, SDKs that interact with APIs and they've kind of written all the network request responses for you. Uh, there's not as much of that for Flutter. However, AWS, uh, there is some new Dart kind of wrappers for that, which is amazing because, you know, I think a lot of people automatically use Firebase with Flutter because that might be the only really rich option, but now AWS has that. Um, but it's gonna take a while before, I think a lot of these uh, big tech companies create their Flutter SDK for interacting with them. But you as a community member absolutely could build that wrapper and, and put it up on GitHub as a plugin, so. So Jared, what's the what's the closest to, to Firebase on the AWS side? What is the- uh, So honestly, my AWS experience has been um, like EC2, Lambda, it's been, kind of those traditional AWS services that a lot of us have used. Right. Um, they do have something and, and anyone feel free to speak up uh, on the, on the, on the zoom. There is a, a sort of a Firebase competitor and I, I I'm blanking on the AWS name of it. So anyone feel free to oh, chat it or. Okay. Yeah. If you can put it in the chat box and if anyone knows, we'll go to the next question. Um, so uh, someone said API, AWS has API gateway and step functions, lambdas. Yeah, um, so that's certainly true. They even have something in addition to that. And I'm just blanking on the name. Yeah, so another question John M asks, it's ID question, the never ending, right? VS Code versus Android Studio. Have you used both of them? For yeah, Twitter? Yeah. so um, the uh, I, I've been using, v maybe I should just standardize, but I've been using VS Code for all my Firebase function stuff in JavaScript. Um, and it's certainly lightweight and doesn't take up a bunch of CPU and memory. Um, I've been using Android Studio for Flutter uh, just because I, I started as an iOS Android developer and it was a familiar environment. I will say Android Studio and Xcode are super heavy and having a, you know both of them open at the uh, uh, same time is, quite heavy on your on your laptop. Um, I was pretty happy with Android Studio. A reason that I stuck with it, especially earlier on, is it had um, more of the Flutter plugin bells and whistles. Um, I'm, and I, I wish I, I had notes here, but there were a few features in Android Studio and the Flutter plugin that were not available in the VS Code plugin. So that was one of the reasons I stuck with Android Studio. Um, that may not be true today. I just haven't spent the time to, to freshen up on the latest on uh, VS Code. But um, I think VS Code's, I think it's a, a great option, assuming that, I assume that the plugin has probably evolved and it's probably something I need to look at. Yeah. So uh, he's asking also if the Firebase functions are written in Node. Uh, so they're written in JavaScript. And my understanding is, it is, my understanding, and I could be wrong, is it is like the Node runtime. So you are able to use like NPM packages um, so that would lead me to think that um, the answer is yes. So what, which version of Flutter was used? Uh, the bleeding, I think it was the beta. Uh, 
Let me do a flutter. Twenty dot four. Let me just do a flutter version. Um, I, anytime I get a message to up to up um, to update, I usually do for better or worse. Uh, I mean, I, I keep updating, but like flutter the beta channel one point two two dot o dash twelve dot one. So um, the beta channel one dot two two. Yeah. So uh, Larry asked, um, he said, I noticed the round buttons at the top are not tappable on mobile web. Was that intentional? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Is that a gotcha? Uh, so, so what was the, the, the question? I noticed the round buttons at the top are not, oh, uh, at the top, round buttons. I think maybe, I think, I think what he's talking about is here. Uh, this is a goofy plugin I use just because I wanted to play with it. Um, I've been told I probably need to get rid of this scrolling marquee because it's really old school. Yeah, these aren't tappable. I, I, did, I did notice that and uh, it's a uh, opportunity uh, for improvement. Uh, I couldn't get the, 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 the gesture recognizer to work on that. So great question, Larry. You weren't supposed to, to figure, figure that out. I wasn't expecting yeah. that. Yeah. So by the way, when, when you were talking about responsiveness, uh, I was wondering if there was a frame, someone, I was pretty sure someone had done some kind of a package. So there's a responsive under, fra underscore framework package, which has a pretty high popularity. I there think, there was, the yeah. And that's a good call out. I, I, I didn't remember the name of it. I, I didn't pull it in. Um, I wanted to see what I could do with just the, the basics. That was doing, um, some interesting stuff that I, I didn't want to get super in the weeds on it because it, on one hand, yes, they did solve some problems that, that make your life easier. Um, on the other hand, they were kind of abstracting away some details. Like they had some kind of code in there that would like, it was like a size aware um, list. So like, as I mentioned, like in, in the case, I, I show a, a I show a list here, but if it's a tablet, I'll show a, like a grid. They were kind of like abstracting away a lot of that. And I, because I didn't have the time to really dig in deep, I wasn't comfortable pulling it in just because it added a dependency and a, some additional complexity. Mm -hmm. um, my, my approach was, I think, pretty simple and I didn't have to pull in a third party dependency. I, I kind of just did a, a check. And um, what's really nice is the, sig the method signature for pulling in a, a list or a grid is actually quite similar. Um, you, is, like the data source is, um, you implement the data source like the same exact way. So it was actually really easy to do that. Um, it had some other features that I, I don't recall around a lot of like auto magic stuff. Um, uh, it's something I, I think it's worth looking into. I, I just didn't have the, the time to, to dig in too deep. So Johnny Peppins is chiming in on the Dart uh, language question that we're talking about. He says, I think Flutter saved the Dart as a language. Yeah, I think that's the whole thrive versus that's the survive thing that we talked about exactly. um, earlier. And then, and then it looks like, yeah, I think AWS Amplify, that, that was the umbrella that, that had the Dart or the, the Flutter support. And then Johnny asked, where do we submit bug reports? <laughs> uh, well, Johnny, you can, you can actually, so Johnny's my, my buddy from, from Capital One. Johnny, you can actually uh, go up here uh, and contribute uh, and, and open some issues and maybe uh, some, put up some PRs, so. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so Larry's asking, is it possible to demo the live flutter? Uh, so uh, unfortunately, the, I ran into issues there. So I, I also, Larry's another buddy of mine. So I might have to talk to you offline about that one, Larry, but um, it basically fails. I, I, I don't feel comfortable like jumping into a debugging session on the meetup, but um, I'd love to talk to you about it and maybe we can partner up and figure out what's going on. But it did work on iOS and Android. So yeah, so I had a question. Sure. So are you are you keeping out analytics? For uh, so I'm not keeping analytics officially. However, Firebase has, Firebase has some analytics libraries, correct? And quite good ones, actually. They do. So uh, I, am, I have not um, integrated that piece yet, but the Firebase Flutter um, library does support that. Um, so just like you can you know, uh, talk to uh, uh, your Firebase Cloud Store -like database or any other Firebase services, um, uh, I would imagine it's quite simple to add. So it's just. Uh, I think I'll add that to my uh, to-do list for my what's next slide. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, good that's call gonna, out. Yeah, it's going to give you good value, I think. Yep. Um, Larry, did you have any other questions? No, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, it's awesome. Yeah. Well, we'll <laughs> again, we're right on time, man. Like almost at the. Hey, what can I say? You know, I just. Uh, <laughs> yes. um, but yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to come speak again. Um, uh, as I mentioned, like feel free to hit me up on Twitter, um, or uh, you know, uh, my email's on my website, so feel free to shoot me a note. Um, but I'd love to talk to you about mobile dev or Flutter, and um, yeah, really just appreciate the opportunity to come speak. Thank you, Jared. I really appreciate it. We appreciate it, Larry, and I appreciate it. Uh, it was a, another wonderful presentation. Um, Man, time flies. I remember it like it was it was like yesterday when you did the first presentation. So here we are. Um, I guess a, a year plus later. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, Larry, if you don't have anything, that's uh, I think that's a wrap up. All right. Thanks, everyone. See ya.